Bjorn Peters. We've introduced him already, so I will keep it short. Again, so IEDB and Bjorn will tell us about um, basically the conventions, <laughs> the conventions uh, for creating, generating a standardized label for classes. Thank you, Bjorn. Thanks, Philippe. So I fixed two typos, so that's why I have a new version. Okay. Okay. So, um, yes, I'll talk about term labels, and I'll start actually with some um, introduction of, of why we are working on this. So this, is, this, this work on term labels is actually kind of a prototype for us on some of the new activities that we're currently doing for the uh, Obo Foundry work. So as the Obo Foundry, as you might know, is an initiative from 2007 about integrated ontology development and with a mission to develop a family of interoperable ontologies that are logically well-formed and scientifically accurate and with the approach that the participants that want to contribute this voluntarily adhere to a set of principles that facilitate the Foundry mission and that then there is a review process of different people uh, who are saying, I want to be part of this and then review me and then you get feedback. Um, there's at this point uh, several hundred in the OBO library that has been referred to and eight, uh, uh, actually nine now uh, ontologies in the OBO foundry. So by far not complete and, and lots of things in the library that are very useful that are not in the foundry and this distinction is one of the things that is potentially problematic. Um, uh, yeah, this is just the information that you find for every ontology on the foundry website, uh, things like mailing lists, contact developers, etc. Um, the OBO foundry principles Roughly, I would uh, separate into things that are common sense, that I think are, are uncontroversial, and everybody here in this green, uh, room would probably agree, such as things that they, uh, to, to be useful, they need to be open so that other people can reuse them. There needs to be a common format, such as OWL and OB, uh, OBO. Um, there, there needs to be identifiers that are somewhat standardized, uh, that you know how to use them. You need to have versioning, some documentation, you need to be able to contact someone, etc. Those things, I think, are, are Pretty much everybody would agree on those. Then there's metadata principles about that there should be textual definition, and then probably that's where the disagreement starts. Uh, but then naming conventions, which I'll talk about, I think there's also some agreement on, on that there's better or worse ways to, to name things. And then there's foundry-specific principles, such as the, the, the vision of delineated content in different ontologies, which is truly uh, problematic in, in many cases. And, and um, this really requires a lot of commitment, uh, using the same relationships, etc., collaborating to uh, deal with issues that arise between different ontologies. Um, yeah. So, since 2014, these were the original processes, uh, principles formulated around 2007. Since 2014, um, there has been kind of a shift of people who are more active in, in this area, and we've been trying to review the review process. So uh, what does this actually mean in many of these cases? For example, what does licensing, the, the open and licensing that enables reuse mean? What actual license do we uh, recommend? And then if you have that, where do you find that license? Actually asking and finding out what a license an ontology has can be extremely non-trivial because there's no agreement on where that is stated. Um, so this is an ongoing process and we're really trying to make this better. Uh, so if there's any problems, um, there is an issue tracker on, on the OBO Foundry website, so submit issues that you have there. So one of the issues that we've identified as this is another volunteer project, the one thing that is most limiting is time. So having this review process and having, having great criteria of what makes a good ontology is, is one thing, but if it takes a lot of time to figure out if an ontology complies with it or not, that is a problem. So we would love to automate the review process as much as possible. That also would then enable us, if you can automate it, not to review once and say, oh, this is great, but rather review every new release and say, does this now suddenly break one of the principles that it formally adhered to? Another advantage of an automated review process where you can compute if an ontology confirms or not is that you focus on things that you can actually make as a hard and fast rule rather than having a philosophical idea of what an ontology is good or bad. You focus on things that you can really test quickly and then state, okay, this ontology confirms to this principle and I can guarantee you, you it, it, whatever, it has a license stated under an, an agreed upon annotation property say. Uh, this will hopefully then also make discussions more productive because you can argue then by saying, okay, uh, I, tell me what code would verify this rule or not, 
rather than uh, having to read uh, several books that you're giving as a reference to um, ontology principle. So our long-term goal right now is to have essentially um, two sets of testing frameworks. One is a unit test framework where you say for a given ontology, does this ontology in itself uh, without any kind of obo foundry, like, like interoperability with others, with the ontology by itself, does it comply uh, to what we consider uh, principles? And then an integration test framework that says, okay, those ontologies that really want to be the foundry and interoperate, you put them all together and you see does the merged ontology uh, break? And, and that would be the more uh, critical integration test. So, and um, actually I can happily you know, say that it does look like we've gotten funding for this. That was why this talk has been kind of changing. So, so that one of the things that we, we want to actually do this now and have some resource to do it, and we want to start with something that is simple and that is term labels. We hope it's simple uh, to ensure uh, the, the, the benefit of this is also that essentially we are hopefully developing code that is useful for, potentially useful for anyone working on ontology development independent of what they think about the OBO foundry or not. So why do we care about term labels? If from, uh, you can say, okay, the real identifier is the uh, ID that you give an ontology term, but a normal humans and encounter ontology terms in an editor or a lookup service on annotated data sets going through the labels. If the labels are confusing, specifically, if a humans can't distinguish between different terms because for the human the labels are identical, but for the computer they are different, then uh, all kinds of things break. Um, the ear example that we just heard from EFO is, is a good one. So in order to um, test in the current ontology world what kinds of things, uh, rules could be come up with, what kind of things uh, occur as problems, we downloaded three million terms from OntoB, that is the library, uh, Ubo library and Ubo Foundry, uh, performed syntactic normalization for the terms individually, and then provided reports back um, essentially for a given ontology what potential problems are. And I, I'll go to, into a little bit more detail for each of these in the next slide. So again, so three million term labels that uh, comprise 72 million characters and those were from 138 different Unicode code points. <clears throat> so the first thing that we wanted to do was to map this to a reduced alphabet. Uh, that is essentially the very same thing you do in natural language processing for token normalization. For humans, things, uh, so specifically capitalization, for example, th there can be a lot of disagreement in uh, how, how people capitalize things. There might be a right or wrong, but uh, more likely than not, if you're thinking two terms that are in the same ontology, one is capitalized, the other one is not, that is, is uh, considered most likely the same term by a casual user who just types it somewhere. So we're considering only lowercase, and you can argue about that. And then you have other things like hyphens. There's three different hyphens that we encounter in, in, in these. And for a computer, those are obviously different characters, and having a different hyphen means you have a different word. Um, uh, worse, uh, there were, I think, eight different spaces. So, so there's uh, uh, no, no space space, fixed width space, no break space. All of these are different characters. Uh, it, there's, there's obviously you have some tabs and new lines that are really crappy. Um, so and, and that, uh, those are the kinds of things where you look at, it, at your data in, in some kind of program and you do not understand why uh, things are considered different by the computer but not by you. And it, I mean here these are examples also that are actually impossible for a human to look at the display terms and say that two things are different when they are not. Then you can really argue about this but um, when you Again, in a large number of duplicates that you get is some people using accents correctly and others are diacritics and others not. Uh, my name is Bjorn. Nobody ever spells it correctly, so I'm used to just going with B-J-O-R-N when I'm in America because people don't have the keyboard for it. People routinely <coughs> use the simpler version of, of um, letters. So again, if you're looking for identity of, of two, two terms, removing this makes the word simpler. Then you have things like the plus minus character uh, where people use plus minus, other use plus slash minus, and spelling it out again makes the alphabet simpler, so that's what we did. Um, then we ended up with 10 characters with only 21 occurrences out of 72 million um, that just said screw it. Uh, like this is the typical example of some kind of um, uh, encoding problems where you're going from 16-bit Unicode to 8-bit, then you always end up with this nice symbol. Uh, then you have alpha, beta, and then you can really argue. Obviously, that's the prettier symbol. But 
95% of people spell those things out in biological names and just spell out alpha or spell out beta. And then there's a few that's not. And when you look at something like alpha beta T cell receptor, if you would auto convert to the text at the moment you actually spell it, you would probably do it with spaces or hyphens. So, I mean, taking 21 occurrences, getting rid of 10 characters, I thought that was a good compromise. So because then you end up with just 68 Unicode code points, all of them are in ASCII, which is actually quite of beautiful for, for because you get rid of all kinds of uh, um, encoding standard conversions that you otherwise always run into when you uh, move this code around. And um, uh, so yeah, sorry. And that is just simply, you're going down from a more complex alphabet to a reduced alphabet. Uh, then this is always fun to have trailing spaces in, in your data, have uh, uh, leading spaces, those are more rare because you can actually see them, or a sequential white space with multiple spaces around it. Okay, just removing them is also uh, um, uh, trivial. And then uh, with this code, which essentially runs through each of these terms, we can provide warnings or errors for each table. So an error would be if you have a character like this, the program would say you really have a problem in here. There should also be an error for something like a new line character within your label, which is really unlikely that you ever wanted that. And then you can have warnings such as uh, for the uh, accents and diacritics where you might probably be pretty sure that this is the right, the right things to do. There's other characters also like, like dollar signs or so, or uh, 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 the ampersand character, which are often issues from HTML formatting that get messed up. Uh, which might be useful to provide warnings for, but there's also valid uh, reasons to use them. So uh, importantly, um, again, like it is uh, often correct to spell something with uppercase, or it is correct to use uh, the appropriate uh, accented characters. So the original label should be there and should be the standard what is displayed. But if you compare two labels in an ontology, uh, what we are essentially proposing here is that uh, labels should be unique in this reduced character space. So there shouldn't be one version with your Bjorn with two, uh, the O dotted and one without, because that is going to cause problem more likely than not. So that then goes to the next part. Once we have this reduced representation, we can check for duplicates. And actually, the first thing that uh, occurred, which I, I didn't even think was possible, uh, was that you have multiple labels in the same ontology for the same class. Because OWL thinks that is a perfectly reasonable thing. And most tools uh, react randomly to this. Which labels get displayed in this case it, it, is completely a, a, a choice. And um, it happens quite a bit because, a number, because of the OWL import properties. Ontologies import some another ontology, and then they import another ontology, and they then import different versions of something, and something was renamed. And then you end up, everything that gets renamed has multiple labels in it, uh, which is a pain. Probably this could be better fixed by having better import procedures and importing the same versions of one ontology and having imports once than multiple times, but yeah. Uh, more interestingly, uh, there were 3% of the cases of, of classes in ontologies where there was duplicates, where in the same ontology you have two classes that have the same label exactly identical without any of the syntactic normalization that I showed you before. When you do the syntactic normalization, you start find an additional, um, a, a relatively few additional cases. Now, clearly this says this is not a huge problem. The, the vast majority of cases uh, is not a duplicate, but even individual cases where this occurs, where you have the same RDFS label in your ontology referring to two different entities can totally break uh, um, uh, workflows. Um, this is all within an ontology. Now in cross ontologies, we run into the problem with the uh, ear of the mouse versus ear of, of corn. And um, there's uh, the desired case of uh, where two ontologies have the same label because they're importing it from uh, another ontology, so that needs to be allowed for. Uh, then there's the, uh, the, if there's truly different classes, um, the first thing we can do is automatically suggest uh, in a way to make the label unique by just adding the prefix. So for example, there's the disease vector versus the numeric vector. And uh, that is, is someone who's somewhat knowledgeable might guess that from here, or worst case, you then go, you know to go and look up the definition. And so we can automatically do this and make sure that labels will be unique across uh, a set of ontologies. And more importantly, then also you would alert the ontology developers to suggest that if this occurs, that maybe they should 
import the same class from externally if, if that's, that's the case rather than having the same one there. Or you can think about adding some terms such as disease vector to vector. Vector is one of the worst terms, occurs in all kinds of places. It means very different things in, in each instance. So that was already it. Um, so we have currently working code that just runs through this and, and, and spits out uh, an evaluation of the uh, different ontologies. Again, this, the goal here for us is to implement it as a test case for the um, OBU, OBO Foundry framework, where you then have also move away from the whole you've been reviewed once, to rather than saying these are the kinds of principles we have, and for each ontology list, if you're working with this, you can uh, assume that all the labels conform to these standards or uh, that there's no duplicates, that it works well when merged with these other um, uh, ontologies or not. Uh, again, this is, uh, we consider this hopefully to be a prototype. We also want to use this because it's computationally, this is simple. It, it, it's, it's, it runs very fast uh, and we can, what we want to figure out more is how do we, how do we formulate these rules? How do we communicate them? How do we get feedback from the community that says, okay, you really shouldn't be uh, punishing our use of uh, alpha and beta. It's crucial for our ontology or not. And, and how can we add to this? Um, and hopefully having a framework like this will lead to a more productive discussion of what principles should we have, how can we test for them, and, and uh, by uh, uh, also sharing this code, hopefully develop something that is useful for ontology developers outside the OBO community at all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Yes, first question. Just to see if I get you right. Uh, I always understood that the IDs would be those where you would compute on, never on the labels or on the terms, right? So I understand that you want to purge uh, as an ontology builder the system and the terms, but from a user perspective, it wouldn't make a lot of problem if you have this smaller, let's say, human readable um, mistakes. Or am I completely wrong on it? So, for example, so now if you're filling out one of these spreadsheets for a term request, and you're filling in out there that the tissue source is ear, right? So which, on, which ontology do you mean? So, so the, the moment you're all user interfaces, when you're dealing with it, you'll be, you'll be wanting to, uh, you're in, assuming when you see the label that you know what it means. Yes, you should be, I, I personally am not capable of uh, memorizing all the identifiers to the ontology. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that you need it as a human being to okay. see what the go term means, but I do not understand why you need this purity in the term labels because you would never compute on them. So that a computer cannot correctly read the term isn't so much of a problem as long as a human being can read I, it. I should have shown more examples. What you end up having is in the same ontology that you have duplicate terms where essentially you have one term with a space at the end, the other one without. And you have two classes with two different identifiers. And they're in, in potentially even different parts of your hierarchy. You do not think that's a problem? Or maybe I can have to clarify that offline. Okay, I can, I can show you maybe offline. So, so. Okay, Phil. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm quite confused actually. I mean, this idea that, that within an ontology and outside an ontology, I don't think this actually has any particular meaning in OWL. Um, you know, if, it's perfectly valid for me to just to redefine the labels on your ontology. So maybe I want them to look nicer for me. Maybe I want to translate them into my language. And why the hell should I not do that? And then your, your system is saying, well, that's okay, but, but I'll still be in that ontology in, in the meaning of the vowel, and then I'm going to get name clashes. I'm going to have multiple labels for one, uh, one concept. But, but they're labels. They're human readable. I mean, give, give the computer a break. If, if, you should, if it's breaking your tools, fix your tools. It's the tools that are broken, not the ontology. I just I think this seems completely ill-founded to me. You're going, it just, just makes no sense to me. Okay, so... Normalizing um, labels, they're labels. Different yeah. people want to read labels right. for different circumstances. Okay, I, I, didn't, I didn't stress this here, but so for example, for the uh, immune epitope database, we are renaming every single class. We are uh, every single one of these. This is for uh, somebody, if you're filling out, so, so the, the vision of the Oval Foundry, again, a set of interoperable ontologies where you have then something like a spreadsheet bed autocomplete auto system where you want to type in the uh, ontology name from a set of ontologies and make sure that you get the right one when you type something in. And not that you have a new ontology that suddenly creates the same name for a different class than you're anticipating. They're meaning something different. The, the semantics are the semantics, and the labels are the labels. Labels are, are meant to be, it's perfectly valid to have that. I mean, I've got more than one name, you know? I mean, give me a break, you know? 
I mean, there's, there's no real reason why you shouldn't do that. And, and to separate, you're, you're going to stop people doing a perfectly set of entirely valid things that they might want to do, like, for example, providing translations, like, for example, okay. air recording. So, for us, examples. translations are a great example, and also this comes into the discussion, which is actually great, and we could have it. Uh, translations are a great example. There is a way how you do translations in our. And yeah, you name you have a language tag that you put next to yeah, yeah. So and it. People, so and people don't. And, okay. So I, I think that we can park this discussion right. uh, for the break, but I think maybe what the one comment I can make is that there is one label which is a prefer label, and if we want alternative term on the class, we can use a specific uh, method in the tag to provide right. that. What, we're, what Björn is talking about is regularization of common mistakes, which should be the goal, I think. But that's just me. So, Sira. So, um, I, I, I think you want committee. Um, comments and, and you're getting that a lot here. So let me give you an example where when you get rid of all the space and dash and all that, you actually are losing semantic meaning. Cell lines, for example. You can have cell line A.1 or you can have cell line A1. You remove the dash, the dot, the slash. Okay, uh, we, you, yes, I'm not sorry, we're not removing the dash, the dot, the slash. There's three different dashes with three different widths. Actually, two have the same width, but they mean something different typographically. Okay, so you're 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 saying that we're these not removing will be punctuations. We're not doing tokenization. Okay, so so my my, my question is, why can't you use pref label when sorry. there's ambiguity like that? So, why we can't be used? Sorry. Pref label, preferred label. Preferred label, yes. Yeah. So if if I'm understanding this right, you are proposing a new obo annotation to be accepted in the community. And in, in our history of bioontologies, we've learned that you want something that the community will adapt, you want to give them some incentive. We have prep label, we have label, we have alternative term, we have synonyms, we have broader term, narrower terms. And this would be the machine simplified written label. So yeah, coming back to, 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 to yeah. Phil's comment, then it's yeah. the tool that is broken. It's not the ontology that is broken. Okay, I, I, should, I should have done more examples. I didn't want to do the whole Barry Smith, I'll stand up here and show the 100 uh, mistakes in all the ontologies crap. Uh, because I find that annoying and offensive. But um, I, I can definitely, um, okay, you can of course if you think like, okay, I'm going to differentiate all my terms by how many spaces I add at the end of my string. If you think that is a useful thing, then sure. Uh, that's going to be a great ontology. I'm going to be annoying and offensive by, um, <laughs> by making a plug for our group that uh, is masquerading as a suggestion. So um, counter, uh, in contrast to um, our colleagues, I, we've had people ask for exactly what you're doing as well, for a way of essentially normalizing, um, normalizing terms in ontology. So there is, there is a use case for this um, coming from humans. Uh, so thank you for doing it. And so my um, suggestion, uh, covering a plug, uh, one of the approaches that we've tried to this uh, to do this is what our users asked for, which was to impose something called univocality. The idea is if you have both something like migration uh, regulation of cell migration and cell migration regulation. To, to normalize those and the way that we do that lets you kind of get around some of the problems that you pointed out with respect to um, multi-word units and uh, the, the characters that are hidden in them um, for the syntactic reasons that makes that easier. Coming at it, uh, and that's from my colleague Karen Verspoor, it was an ISMV paper to plug another person from our lab that will come at the problem for you from a different angle, Chris Funk. He's worked on generating synonyms, uh, specifically from the gene ontology, but it should work for any. And what I think that might help you do is to recognize when, when you have things like cell migration regulation and regulation of cell migration. So that, there clearly is a use case for what you're doing, at least from from our community. So actually, the, the, the whole Go family had a, 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 a fantastic uh, lexical and syntactic checking of term names. They recently switched to editing them manually. And so when I ran this and showed it to Chris, 
he immediately he was <laughs> quite upset that a number of the new terms now added uh, invalidate the original Go policies with the typical you have two spaces somewhere in the middle of something like that. So uh, this is not a novel uh, idea and maybe I'm, I'm overstating here the, the, the excitement about this specific use case. I think I do think um, okay, so for us also, this doesn't come out of nothing. This comes out of building tools where typically users want to enter labels. Um, and they then having this problem that you have uh, not a one-to-one uh, uh, -one mapping between what the user thinks the label is and what the computer thinks the label is, is a problem. So we were trying to have, uh, and then, okay, again, the other thing is, uh, so we should have a discussion with Phil, and we should grab some beer and stuff. Um, that that it, it will be nice. I hope Phil will agree to that. Uh, um, to have a, a, a simple case of where we have rules at an ontology and across ontology levels that we can test this out. We can run this also just as simply to validate that there's an annotation property for the um, uh, for, for, for the license agreement. We can validate that, that, that the URI where you state your files can be downloaded from is actually valid. Stuff like that. Okay. Oh yeah. No. I, so yeah. No. I'll finish with this. So I, I love this. I, I, I hope our users don't do that. <laughs> 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 All right, sorry.